Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, week five, week week five, week six. Um, we're going over chapter five of our packages. Um, and I believe this is titled The Package Within. Um, and we have Rebecca uh, to go over the notes and uh, lead us in discussion this week. Uh, so I'll hand it over to you, Rebecca. All right, thanks. Um, I thought this was a pretty fun chapter. Um, and great. Um, yeah, I let me know if there are any questions. Gabby, I'm excited to hear what you were thinking about while you were reading it. Um, yeah, I'm happy for any interruptions at any point. So um, this chapter was not particularly going over um, things that were new. They did mention you didn't, it was not really a prereq to other content in the book, um, but it just kind of, it went over a few examples of um, like how you would get from a package to a script, at, uh, sorry, from a script to a package and some of the common problems you might run into. Um, some of the solutions, which we already know about from like the whole game and package structure and some of which we don't really yet know about like data. Um, so yeah, the things that I thought were kind of highlighted was to see the potential package, which um, for me is not always obvious. So I liked that. Um, and some of the key differences you need to pay attention to when trying to do the transition and um, yeah, some other key details. Um, so uh, one thing I will start with though is, so if you clone the, um, the R packages book, from GitHub, packages within files is where they have all of these different um, uh, versions of, of what they're gonna go through. Um, so yeah, anyway, I will click through that a little bit, but not too much, whoops. Um, so, all right, they walk through a very small toy package and really emphasizing how it differs um, in a package version from a script. So again, we're starting with a script, and we're pulling out the things that might be reusable to put into a package. And then we're also combining that with a script that's now simpler and uses the functions from the package. And it makes some illustrative mistakes that I have also made. So um, yeah, I, I quite liked it. So you're starting with a script. What's the purpose of this script? Um, it is, we're looking at a tiny data set of a CSV of five lines where we know some people's names, we know where they were, and we know a temperature. And the goal seems to be like to get an accurate temperature and on the same scale. So these temperatures of the air temperature um, are presumably uh, on different scales and they're using the location that someone reported swimming um, as a proxy for whether or not this was measured and reported in Celsius or Fahrenheit um, via whether or not they think this is British or uh, American English. So that's the entire point is to write out a clean data set that has these all on Celsius scale. So converting the ones that they think are on Fahrenheit right now. Um, and this is the code right now, um, just some where statements and a function or not a function, just some code um, translating Fahrenheit to Celsius after determining whether or not they think someone's location was in the US or in the UK based on what word they used to describe the beach. Um, and so they save it in a CSV folder file and uh, they uh, use, they format the time at which this was written and they include that in the name of the CSV file. And um, so you've got the whole year, month, date. Um, this is the hours, minutes, seconds swim they started with. So um, they started with their in file swim, add clean to it and save .csv. And then they save that out. And that's the goal of the script. And so the idea being that this is something that the person is doing in some form pretty often. Can you make it better? A, a better script and can you make it into some sort of package that would be more usable? Um, so 
right? They're saying that there's a package within the script somewhere, um, but it's not always easy to see if you have not um, based on how the code is written right now. <laughs> and I popped four links here for this one statement, which they said, a good first step is to refactor this code. And I have seen this word a lot and have an idea of what it means, but I didn't really know what it means. So Google took me um, firstly to this book called Refactoring, um, which I did definitely did not read, but it sounds like a great book. Um, and his definition of it that I think is reasonably adopted is like small changes in code that improve your ability to modify it, but that do not itself like or improve it, improve its stability or something, but without changing its output. So making it easier to work with in the future generally making, um, but without changing the function of it is refactoring. Um, also the, the quote that we like to attribute to a few different people in the tidyverse world of, of um, like if you've done it three times, make it a package. Um, he also quotes some, this is a 1999 book and he apparently also quotes someone who was pre presumably prior to 1999. So apparently that's an idea that's been around for a while. Um, so that looked like something that I should read. <laughs> um, Jenny Bryan has, you know, this great uh, video. Actually, it's, there's more here than I realized, remembered. I need to revisit all of this. Um, but she has a, a slides and a video, uh, like an hour long video on code smells and feel. And then she's got like a lot of other resources um, that are probably relevant. Um, and Emily Reederer gave a talk, uh, had a blog post and a talk at 2020 R Studio Conf um, about taking our markdowns and not that every R markdown needs to be a package, but how to more on this like script to package, you know, less on the details of the package, but more on the script to package process that I thought was, I, I had read this post before and it's similar to the, um, the R packages book and um, a bit what it's talking about, but just a bit more detail. But what she also has that I had not realized is a technical appendix where she talks about like all these packages um, and tools to help help do that. Um, so uh, obviously the final part to package, it's use this, test that, dev tools, right? <laughs> but um, all these things about repetition and functions and cleaner code, um, there are a lot of, lot of things I didn't know about that um, still don't know much about, but <laughs> it seems like a really good resource. Okay, so um, in the second version of the script where the goal again is to like make a better script. So the goal is to refactor it and try to make the changes that, sorry, the things that um, are like specific to this file isolate them from functions and processing. So um, uh, yeah, so first of all, the earlier they had um, used, uh, no, I've already forgotten, let's go back to alpha, <laughs> data cleaning. All right, so earlier they'd done this, um, right, they'd done this process, but in reality, a lot of us would be reaching for um, diff different tidyverse functions to help with this processing, right? Um, so that's kind of the primary thing they add on is this dplyr dependency, or they, sorry, they load tidyverse and use some of these functions, read R, read CSV, and, um, uh, you know, they do a join from this table, right? This table makes it much easier to add modifications later in the, fu in the future. If you've got this tibble, um, the lookup tibble, the lookup table, <laughs> um, and they turn the converting, rather than just doing this inline, they make a function for Fahrenheit to Celsius. Um, and they use a mutate for that versus back here, they used base R. So that reflects maybe how a few of us would have been more like more likely to have written this code. And they make a, a function itself for um, creating the name of the place that they're gonna send, uh, send this clean file to the name of the file. So I stared at this for a little while, trying to figure out why they thought it was a good idea to keep this outside of the function. And for anyone who hasn't read the package, like that becomes one of the points. So don't bother staring at this, wondering why they did it, because this is an example of a problematic thing later on. Um, right, so they added these functions, they made a, a nice lookup table, and they actually used dplyr helper, pack, helper functions that we would 
probably use ourselves, or at least I would. Um, so this works, it's a better script and that's where they're starting for um, heading, um, almost heading to a package, but they do one more step for making it um, more reusable uh, is that they take out the lookup table that they have within the script and they save it as a CSV. And they take out the functions and put them in a helper file, uh, an R file. So now you've got like three different things really going on. And in the script that you're actually using for cleaning your data, it's just going to have a tiny, tiny bit of functions. But that um, any data sets you rely on don't need to be created with this script and any functions that might be usable for other, other processing things you do um, can get uh, put in a, in a, file itself that is just for functions. Um, so again, now they have a, now that we're in Charlie and yeah, I totally agree with the design stuff. Um, did I skip clicking on that design one? Was that linked here or is it linked elsewhere? No, I think it's the next one. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going to make the chat larger because I feel left out. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. All right, design comes up later. I think that I have not looked at it in detail, but it does look awesome. Um, so, all right, we're on Charlie. So now Charlie is, again, like modularizing these things into separate functions rather than just organizing them into one, sorry, into separate locations as opposed to just one script that's better organized. So that's the point of Charlie. Um, Great. So it's now. So now you've got uh, the helper file. Cleaning helpers is an R file that has these useful functions where we're reading the CSV and that is saved elsewhere. Um, we have a function for Fahrenheit to Celsius. We have a function that um, actually uses Fahrenheit to Celsius if and only if this if we think that person was swimming in the U.S. And um, then there's this out file path function. Um, so now the func the script, all right, we're in Charlie, Charlie, let's close the old thing. We go into our data cleaning file and this is all it is, right? It's tiny. All we're doing is reading in our file or sorry, we are loading tidyverse and we are sourcing those cleaning helpers, which makes all of those functions available to us, right? Um, do that. No, <laughs> um, we're not sourcing that. Um, and it may, but it makes all those functions available to us. We're reading in our data file, um, swim.csv, which is in whatever working directory. And the only thing we have to do is um, localize beach, salsify temp, call those two functions, and then write.csv. So a lot simpler, cleaner, easier to read. So they link to the tidyverse design guide, which John already linked to in the chat. And I'm um, I have not spent much time with whatsoever, but what I have spent, I really like. Um, and he does also have a sub stack about this, which again, I haven't spent much time. One of the things I really like about this book is that he gives really concrete, um, he or they, is it just Hadley? Um, examples of what the negative impacts of if you, um, you know, go against if you do something that is in violation of these recommendations. So I really felt like it was really helpful to concretize some of their examples by really specific places where they've backed themselves into a hole with some <laughs> decisions they've made in the past. Um, yeah, so they give some examples of like, oh, just actually, I didn't understand the magical defaults part, but you know, just having a true or false. Well, in the future, that only works if you think there are really truly only two options, but future, you might find that there are three or four <laughs> options. So I thought that was a really good example. Yeah. Um, I really like that structure where like all, pretty much all the chapters are this same group of sections of what's the problem. What are some examples? What are the exceptions to this? And then, you know, what causes it? And, and then importantly, how do I deal with it if I've already done this wrong? Mm. And so I I really like that. So good stuff. And the magical defaults just means when, when or magical, what was it? Magical. Uh, yeah, it's magical defaults. 
Magical defaults, yeah. It's when things like uh, happen that you don't tell the user. So it's if you have an option that sets something, have that option be an actual argument so users can override it, things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This, it wasn't clear to me what, what's happening here. I didn't play with it, but how that you can have why um, row names being null is diff gives you a different result than if you specify row names as null. So the default yeah. that seemed super magical, and I did not look into it, but made me feel like the book is very valuable. Yeah, um, but, uh, advanced R would get into some of that stuff. Okay. better than here probably um but it's basically just they're using missing which is did the user supply an argument regardless of what the argument is kind of set to and that can lead to magical uh magical defaults like yours like they have here so okay it's basically you have to do it on purpose and the data frame code does it on purpose and then it makes it confusing so yeah aware of that <laughs> mm, okay all right cool um so yeah really great resource so then they actually moved to the key bits which is trying to um turn this into a package so um i will say if you go straight to delta it gets a bit confusing because they make changes from where they start versus where they end so, um, yeah, I'm going to go through the, the text because that seems more straightforward to me. But just if you end up confused like me, because if you just try to run it, it runs differently because they've made a few changes throughout the, this chapter. So they use, use this to create a package, um, the scaffold of one. And they take cleaning helpers from Charlie. So, yeah, don't look at the Delta cleaning helpers because they modify it. Um, so this is the cleaning helpers they take. So they just straight up take it and stick it in the package um, with library tidyverse right there with <laughs> these five, four, four functions. Yeah, I can count. Five functions. Um, and they put the each table lookup, that CSV file into it. And then they install it with DevTools install. And the script they're trying to run is the same thing. Um, the only change they make is this cleaning helpers.r. So um, this actually does successfully install. Um, but when you try to run it, you get an error right away that it can't find the first function it hits. Um, and so if you're, you know, there. They, they didn't export them, so they're not available anywhere. So the next thing they go, so even though you called library, none of those functions were exported, so none of them are available. Um, so then the next thing they say is attaching a package does not put functions in the global workspace. This made me realize that I really didn't know what attaching a package was. They cover <laughs> that um, here, which I thought was helpful. Um, the differences between loading and attaching. Um, and I did go back to like the package structure and state. It's not covered there because there, when you like when you library something, you load it and attach it. Um, but so I think before you're any sort of developer, all you really care about, as far as I know, is is loading and attaching. But now that we're in package land, we also care about loading but not attaching. And so they say that these are really the two. I mean, this is in chapter ten, so we'll get there in more detail. But um, if it's loaded like this requiring namespace, then you can access the functions from it. Um, uh, yeah, so that is useful if, for, for our world now. Um, going back. So, um, but if you just do that, sorry, if you just attach a package, you don't, you don't have access to the functions. It is in memory. Correct me if I'm using any words wrong. It's in memory, but um, the pack, the functions themselves um, are not in the global workspace, in your global environment yet, or workspace. Um, actually, those are probably two separate things, aren't they? I shouldn't have used the word environment. 
<laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, yeah. So you could so you could access these if you'd done like delta three colons, but you couldn't access them just by trying to, um, just by trying to run this this script. Um, so we need to export them in the in the cleaning helpers package file uh, package script where the functions are defined. We need to add that raw oxygen tag. Adding that raw oxygen tag is not enough because you need to translate the raw oxygen tag to actually get it in the package namespace. And that's what document does. Document would also write the like man folder documentation. Um, we're in Delta now. Let's go. As you can see, they have a namespace. So they do end up exporting these three files. Um, sorry, three functions. Um, but they don't have a man folder. They don't have any, um, they don't document anything about them. So, um, right. That's what I added there. Um, so if you dev, if you document them, that will update the namespace so that they're actually exported by your your tag, your Roxygen export tag. So um, what they do in Delta is they, so let's go back to the Delta file. Do, 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 that with an R, cleaning helpers. So they export localized beach. They don't export the Fahrenheit to Celsius function um, because this is not one they expect the user end user to want or need, don't want to show it to the end user. Um, but they just use it in this Celsify temp function. They also don't export the timestamp function, but they do export this out file path function. Um, and so now if you reinstall with DevTools install, the script, the package again installs successfully. Um, but if you try to read it, you get stuck. If you try to run your cleaning code, you get stuck at the localized beach function, which uses this lookup table. Um, so this they go into like no detail about other than we'll cover it later. So chapter seven data um, about where you should actually put small data files, right? There are limits on CRAN of how big packages can be, but small helper data files um, where they should exist. Um, but for now, the kind of the point is just it's not, this is not something that is accessible to your package. So that's kind of mostly where they end it. <laughs> um, but, and one of the points about this is that you can successfully install and um, attach broken packages. Uh, so that, if that's your workflow, um, you could be, you could be, letting errors persist in your package that you're unaware of. However, there's this magic package called DevTools that has this function called check that would have told you about some errors. Um, so one thing that if you run check on the package as it exists um, in this version is you'll get an error about this tidyverse. There's no package called tidyverse. Um, you were able to run this read CSV code, even though there's no tidyverse because you yourself had loaded tidyverse. Um, but that's not at all how you're supposed to deal with dependencies in packages, um, right? That was, that was a, this, we learned about that with the description section, right? So the use package, um, dev tools or use this use package will add that to the description don't, did they do that in Delta? Uh, no. Right, so they do it in the next section. So um, yeah, just a point that that is absolutely not the right way to declare any sort of dependencies. Um, so then you would get to a working, this, ver this version of Echo is going to work. Um, so the first thing is we're getting rid of any CSVs because we don't know how to deal with data yet. Um, and we're just going to create the create the table within um, the package file itself, um, which works and is a solution. Um, so things are now nicely exported. Um, but um, 
Oh, right. Sorry. And they also added this improvement of once you um, once you have these external dependencies, you're supposed unless you're importing the whole function, um, you're supposed to declare them declare each usage of them explicitly. So they need to exist both in the um, description file and then also and it tells you this when you use DevTools um, or use this use DevTools use package, right? It tells you that it just gives you a little reminder that you're supposed to call these external functions with the package name colon colon function. Um, and also, like, like mentioned earlier in the chat, we should not be using tidyverse in packages whatsoever. Um, and in our packages book, they linked a blog post from like 2018 saying tidyverse is only for um, EDA or, or you know, uh, analysis usage or whatever, not for packages. Packages go for those minimal, the the most. Even in 2019, there are, I don't know, 79 dependencies or something. Um, you're trying to go for something minimal, just use dplyr itself, whatever function. Um, and so all of the, this, this script is now looking pretty OK. All of the user functions are, user facing functions are exported. And all of our external functions are called with the package name function. I think that's it then. And they were documented, so they're in the namespace. And so you can install it and you get two um, issues, one note and one warning. So um, the note is interesting. So it's saying that they don't know about a global variable or function, but um, English or temp. So in Salsify temp in the function, um, why am I not scrolling the right way? Okay, sorry. Um, so if you go back to the where these cleaning helpers were made, Salsify temp, um, English and temp are both used, and DevTools check or our command check is saying it doesn't know these these objects did not exist in the global namespace in the global environment. Or something. Um, I'm using casual language here, so. That's the what that note is. The second warning is saying that um, there are functions that we didn't document. So um, there's no documentation for these external functions. We just exported them, but we didn't document them. Um, the reason that temp and English come up as problems is because you're using unquoted variable names from dplyr inside of a package. So. Um, you know, the joys of working with dplyr are also, I mean, there's a little bit more work as a programmer with dplyr or a developer with dplyr. Um, so the non-standard ev evaluation causes a little bit of problems and there are apparently a few different ways to get around this or to deal with it. To, um, so one of them that they mention <laughs> is you can just put this somewhere, um, utils global variables. And so it thinks these are global variables. Which, um, or you can do this other option. Um, Jenny also mentions that there are even more options that are possible. Um, I don't know what those are. So this seems to be an option very much in use, the utils global variables. Um, this is from dbplyr. And that's how they pull in, that's how they solve the, the warning, the note. Um, and the vignette, one of the vignettes she linked to is the using dplyr in packages, which talks about a lot of issues you can run into that I didn't know about. So that the um, data masking and non-standard evaluation um, are just one problem you can run into. So they talk about using rlang. So you get a note if you just try to like in a function refer um, to the unquoted um, column names. So they say use Arling for data masking. Use uh, Arling and the data prefix. And for selection, so you add, add dot data as your as your uh, yeah as your prefix to your to your data variables for any of the data masking things. And for selection, just quote them. 
So that was one of the recommendations. This whole vignette made me appreciate that there are a lot of ways, if you're actually on CRAN, that you can run into problems if you've got dependencies. So, I mean, they talk you through how to deal with um, if there's a development. They talk you about through how to deal with changes that happen over time, um, including, which I think are primarily like around release time where things mostly um, can get gnarly um, as they're rolling out a new change in dplyr. Um, and so, yeah, you've got some, a couple of options as if things, if function, um, if functions have changed over time in a way that is a breaking change for you, or if functions have moved over time in a way that's a breaking change for you. So yeah, well, just a couple of issues I didn't had not thought about at all. Um, the other thing is I didn't remember what the deal with notes was. So right, they just give you one note, like it's not a big deal. Do you really have to fix that? So um, they do mention in later on in the book, they um, have a whole thing on releasing to CRAN. And they do talk about eliminate as many notes as possible. Each note requires human oversight. So um, yeah, you're trying to get down to zero, not always possible, but even for notes that don't sound that serious in my mind, you're really trying to get to zero. Um, so the next thing you do, if you actually run this, um, and yeah, you have to use the use import from Arling to get that dot data prefix available. And so then you have to add Arlang as a dependency. Thank you, John. If you uh, yeah, if you run that use import from, it takes care of everything. It makes Arlang a dependency, and which, I, I mean, technically that's also exported by some of the other um, tidyverse functions. But Arlang is a dependency for you if you're using anything from the tidyverse, so it's easier to go to the source like that. Um, and you know you can use those other te techniques, and I used to always do the you know, um, use global, whatever. Um, but eventually it just, it gets ugly. It's a, it's a hack fix versus, you know, eventually learn to use the dot data and then you don't have uh, as many issues anymore. So the dot data only work, the dot data is, you would still get the... Wait. Yeah, just quote. So it's okay. it, you quote things if it's a name, and then you yeah. okay. and then data you don't if you to... are referring to the the actual data. Yeah, okay. and then you don't have to do any of the global that that, that takes care of ninety nine percent of the time or something, and then you don't or one hundred percent of the time. One hundred percent of for that particular issue. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. I will say honestly, this can this is a huge rabbit hole, um, and it's one that I've gone down for hours and hours and hours. Um, because different dplyr functions, you know, use there's data masking and then there's um, non-standard evaluation and there's like a whole bunch of different mechanisms that are operating under the hood. So sometimes dot data works and sometimes um, other there's, things work and sometimes you think dot data is going to work but it like doesn't for some reason. You have to figure out why it's not working. So um, I have spent a long time on this and still don't feel confident in it. Uh, might be worth another its own discussion so at some point. It, it should be down to just the two and like if you click on filter or for example, or any function, go to function help, uh, Rebecca. Yeah, yeah, I'm going Just any, yeah, it's gonna any you. one of them. And so yeah. if you see uh, like the dots go to go up, right. yep. yeah, yeah, they yeah. say data right. masking. If they uh -huh. say data masking, use dot data. If they don't say data masking, use quotes. And that's, yeah, I, I think I know that's that universal had, now. In the I know that I've had trouble where there have been um, is things where I've tried what I thought was supposed to be the answer and it has not worked. And then okay. I've tried the other and it has also not worked. So this is a longer discussion. I'm just okay. warning people that this yeah. unfortunately <laughs> is a bit of a morass. Fair enough. Um, yeah, so the next thing they go into is um, this thing that they showed in the beginning that didn't really seem to make sense. So if you... Uh, we go to the R file of cleaning helpers. Oh, let's open here. They have this, they declare now. And so if you actually were to install this version of the package, where now is defined outside of this path, where the again the point of the path was to timestamp when you were running it. Now is always the exact same time. Every time you run out file path, it never changes. And um 
uh, the timestamp never changes. So your out file path is you're just rewriting over the same thing over and over again. Um, and it is not necessarily um, related to the first time you run path. Um, it is so uh, it reflects the time that the function that the function timestamp was first run. Well, now and timestamp, whatever. Um, and so this is executed, this whole thing, the whole is executed when the package is built for the first time. So then you're like, okay, when exactly are packages built? And packages are, so the definition of package built here is when they're compiled. So that is basically when you run installed up packages from source, actually, you can look at this again. Um, so it's when you're moving from source and you're moving to binary from source and um, uh, 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 something else, source and bundled, right? So binary and installed is where things are is where that time will be made. So if you install that package, oh, bundled a binary to installed, right? So um, basically when you install that packages, but also at some point if you dev tools build, if that's where you're in in your package development, um, you will, that's when it's actually compiled. And that's the only time that um, that now is run. And where on earth did my slides go? Um, this is fun, too many tabs, that's life. Um, okay. That was probably it. Oh well. Um, yeah, lots of lots of lots of tabs. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's a problem. And if that had seemed like a weird usage from the beginning, that's because it was a weird usage. And I think it's kind of kind of clear that now should be in there for this example function. But it's nice to think about the fact that um, these functions are run for the first time as they're being installed. Um. Yeah, so the next thing I'm going to talk about has already been talked about in the chat, and that is side effects. So if you were to run this function as it exists in Delta, we're now in Delta. Let me close everybody. So we're in Delta. Nope, we're in Foxtrot. Um, hmm, they don't have a Foxtrot. OK. Um, because it's the same package. Um, so are our functions. So we, right, we have, we set this format. All right, so timestamps don't work properly. You fix, let's fix the timestamps. Uh, yeah. So you're fixing the timestamps. Um, we did this, we talked about this. And then we're in golf, there we go. <laughs> So uh, the point is we're trying to create the timestamps all in the same time zone. There was there were no side effects yet. Now we're going to create some side effects by solving the timestamp problem. Um, because the timestamps depend on part of the world you're in. We're on a global team and we want things to look the same across our team. That's the point of now. So um, we can do that by using some of these system settings. Um, there you can set locales. Uh, if you you can force this locale um, time zone on people, and this will enable it so that when we look at things that were created across our team, um, we'll see something meaningful. So I actually think it's better to look at the should, should have popped this into the into this presentation. So they show an example of what this looks like. Um, so. Originally, you've got people using all sorts of different time zones and this LC, which I don't know what it stands for. Um, and, you know, so you've got different languages going on and and different times. Um, <laughs> so uh, our timestamp is now fixed if we use this and that everyone's on UTC and all the timestamps, all the files will look the same. Um, and will be like relatively the same, all in the same units, time zones. Um, but if someone from Brazil had written the use this function prior to us making that change, it would have been in Portuguese. 
Um, but after we make this change, all their all their files are going to be in English, not just the files that use out file path. They're going to see English throughout their entire usage of um, anything that has to do with system.time because we've actually changed that throughout. So really big no um, and not supposed to do it. And uh, yeah, I don't know exactly to what degree these are CRAN. Um, yeah, anyway, I'm not supposed to change people's state. That's, that's true in general. Uh, I'm not sure to what degree um, these are rules versus best practices. Because it does talk in the CRAN guidance, it also does talk a bit about like you have to inform people very much if you have any like persistent changes. Um, so with R is a nice handy dandy package that helps make sure that any changes you make are just within the scope of the function and are undone as the function exits. Um, so they give three different examples of how to do that. Um, so with R is a seems like a really really handy function handy package to to get comfortable with um, if you're doing anything like this. So um, yeah. So it, it helps make sure that any changes you make to anything at all there with our functions for, I don't want to say everything, but maybe close to everything, um, changing and restoring state so that anything you do, like changing the number of digits, um, yeah, any options and things are, are done or don't persist outside the, the function itself that you're using it for. So super handy. I think that came up um, at some point with, um, yeah, in the chat last week, there was some mention of global environment, or maybe I just brought that up. I don't remember. I, yeah, that you can, in CRAN, they tell you not to, mo in the CRAN guidance, they tell you not to modify your the user's global environment. So um, when, so I, that comes up a bit in the data chapter, I think, um, because they'll start, they talk a little bit about how you actually appropriately put data. Um, and the data is actually existing in the package environment. And I think this, I, I mentioned this in the chat, but that like I'm using Bioconductor for the first time and like a lot of packages end up in my global environment without me realizing it. Or not a, a lot of packages, a lot of um, data sets that I'm like, where did that come from? Who Who owns this? Because it gets stuck in my global environment. And that is a no, no on CRAN. And um, that's everything I know. And I feel like there's a lot more going on in the chat that I should know about. <laughs> so yeah, questions, feedback, um, lots of um, other people's knowledge that's beyond my own. Um, related to the chat in the, or to the conversation in, in the chat, um, I don't, I don't know of a way to just universally see that these things happened. And therefore I don't know that they would necessarily be caught by CRAN, depending what you're doing. Like, unless you do something that reveals that change, they might not see it. But um, so, you know, basically don't just assume because it's on CRAN, it's not doing any of these things. Uh, it still could be, and you should watch out for that. I don't, I'm not sure, um, but there yeah, are I don't know if there's things, an automated yeah. check. I was talking to someone at Posit last week. I mean, I was not talking about this. I was just a fly on the wall. And he mentioned that on CRAM packages, you're not, CRAM packages, you're not allowed to modify the global environment. So I was talking about their internal package where they definitely do that. Um, yeah. So I hear you that it might not be, um, it might have not, yeah. have not have strict enforcement. That could very right. well be. I'm also not used to it happening. Yeah. In, in yes, positive packages, but like it could accidentally happen in a bad practice potentially. Yeah, and and if it happened, it would be more likely to be something like, you know, deep in the locale settings or something where it's not going to show up unless you start showing month names somewhere else or things like that. Um, I think in chapter fifteen, the advanced testing techniques. I think they're going to go into. There's a relatively new thing in test that and if it's not there um i can't uh, um we'll see when we get there but there's a um a thing that lets you you can put up set up a thing to test for changes 
So, you know, you could have a, I don't remember what they call it, but it's like a, a state inspector, something like mm -hmm. that, that you can set up for your test that you say before and after every test, check the value of this system variable, for example. And then it'll throw an error if any of your tests change the system state in that way. And that's a way to kind of, you know, to catch yourself. But you have to like explicitly look for it. So it's still not going to automatically check things. It's just like I've had things where like I'm pretty sure I'm restoring all of this, but maybe, you know, like I have to, if you have um, functions that are generating packages, you have to do some really weird things in the tests because you're mm -hmm. like creating a package and testing from within that package, basically. And so you have to, uh, you know, I had to set things up to make sure that I was going back to the real package that I'm actually working on. Um, and that's just an example of these state inspectors might not have made it into the book. So I, I think it might be one of those things that they developed right after they finished the book. Um, we'll see when we get there, I'll bring it up. <laughs> Um, this might be um, answered in chapter 11, maybe, with dependencies. Um, but I think, I was wondering, um, so we have dplyr in the imports, um, but dplyr has its own um, other packages that it relies on. Um, yeah, you don't have to deal with those at all, to my understanding. How do you know um, what packages get loaded? Because um, you can see like, oh, this depends on dplyr, but then you're like, okay, what else is it bringing in? Probably a function for that, but I don't know. There is a package that um, like will trace the whole history there. It's, it can be complicated mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and by the way, this is the name of the test that function that I was looking for. So set state inspector, if you want to go read about that. Um, as far as, I mean, you know, you know what packages that dplyr brings with it by looking at the description of dplyr and then you look yeah. at the description of each of those packages to see what they bring with them. And there, I've seen a couple of different things that will build the whole tree. Um, I can't, I don't think DevTools has anything in it that will do that automatically Does all the way down. Oh, pack. Because they use it or somehow. I'm not sure. Cause I like, if, if you look at um, when we get into, especially CRAN stuff, they'll do um, RevDep checking, reverse dependency checking. And so in order to do that checking, or basically any of the things that do installation, they're effectively building these trees. So they have something somewhere. Um, but yeah, I can't think of what I've seen that does it. Um, like uh, Renv also must do that because it's figuring out the versions of all the packages that you're using and presumably all the packages that they use. and all the packages that they use. Um, but I can't, I can't remember. I'll have to go through some code. Um, there was a, there, there have been talks about, I mean, there's a, a whole lot, and actually we're going to get into it in like chapters 10 and 11 <laughs> about, uh, yep, there we go. <laughs> um, like there's a, there's a, a the whole discussion is going to be coming in ten, in probably 10, but it, there's the balance of, oh, I don't want to take on an extra dependency, but that means that you're writing the code yourself. And if it's not a thing that you specialize in, you're more likely to have mistakes than the dependency. So just take on the dependency, probably, but it depends what it is, obviously. Um, but yeah, that package dependencies tree, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that makes sense of not taking on too many dependencies, but also the uh, like I think it's very easy as a uh, as a newbie to accidentally, you know, in your script especially have 
many more packages yeah. than you'd actually truly well, use, especially meta packages or yeah and there is there's definitely something to like if you are using tibbles but just using tibbles don't take a dependency on dplyr take a dependency on tibble um and you know things like that walking through you want to use kind of the um the package that's closest to the root <laughs> mm. like that has the package that has the fewest dependencies just be, partly because you know if dplyr updates your code like you have to check that your things don't break but it, it, there's no way that it broke because the package that updated isn't actually the package you're using so you know things like that so um going more towards the root is definitely a good way to go L like for example importing dot data from rlang don't import it from tibble or dplyr or per or whatever because it actually lives in dplyr i mean in uh, rlang Um, yeah, <laughs> somewhat related, but so I noticed that they use the pipe in uh, this package. Um, <laughs> like, is there like that many trade offs between using this pipe versus like the new pipe? Um, I feel like it might not be that big of a deal. So, um, and yeah, pillar glimpse versus dplyr glimpse on hell brought up. Um, mm -hmm. they support back a certain number of versions and I can't remember their rules, but the tidyverse goes back farther than most people. And we're not to the point yet that you, that the, the base pipe existed. If you go back the number of versions that they support. And so, cause if you use the base pipe in your package, anyone who is using an R version from before the base pipe, it won't work. Oh. So, um, yeah. So there's that. So that was what our, is that 4.1 or 3.6? That might be what, so yeah. Okay. They require 3.6. I think 4.1 is the, the base pipe. Um, and I do know that, uh, this spring with the next version, next, you know, um, minor version of our, uh, a lot of systems that that's the point where it's like, okay, uh, 4.1 is old enough now that a lot of things are saying, yeah, it, I thought it was 4.1. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of packages will be updating to use it. There isn't, so technically it's faster than the, uh, mm -hmm. McGritter pipe. Um, depending what you're doing, that may or may not matter. Uh, It'll be nice when it's possible to standardize at least. And it, you know, it depends what you're doing. If you're doing code that like would never reasonably be run, or or I don't know, that you don't care whether it's run on an old version of R, then use the new pipe. I've I've been using the new pipe a lot. And then actually within packages, I mostly don't use the pipes either way. But it, the nice thing about the base pipe is like, it's the same as far as the system knows, it's the same as writing the code without the pipe. Like the interpreter effectively sees that code as just nested parentheses. And so um, you get kind of the best of both worlds. I don't know, I'm, I'm blathering on about that a little bit that there isn't a hard and fast rule yet, but uh, if you need to support versions older than 4.1, then you can't use the base pipe. So I guess that is a hard and fast rule. <laughs> so the tidyverse meta package um, is 3.3. .3, so you're right, quite old. Um, yeah. I was just looking to test that. But the uh, <laughs> yeah, in their programming with dplyr, they have a bit of, oh, you can actually put if else statements in your, uh, someplace you wouldn't expect it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, so for, for versioning, but one question I had kind of about this chapter in general, um, don't know that we can really get to it in a couple of minutes, but, <laughs> and I think some of these book, these resources that were linked and discussed are probably be very helpful. But one thing that, um, I feel like I don't know how to do, or, you know, this whole design is important. Um, 
I'm feeling like when you're looking at a function, how do you know how many things should be abstracted out in the helper function? Sometimes I'm reading other people's code and I'm like, why are there so many helper functions? Are these really helping? Or are they like adding a layer of abstraction that confuses me in another place I need to go? Obviously, if they're being reused in a bunch of places, I understand that. But when you're starting from the ground, like um, if you're taking your own script that doesn't yet have that many places that similar thing is used yet, but you're trying to design for future you or future coworkers, um, like how to, you know, when you look at this tidyverse style guide, it's like, oh, spaces. Okay, I can just follow these instructions, <laughs> you know. Um, but when you talk about designing actual functions, I felt like yeah, that seems actually important and confusing. And I'm sure that <laughs> I'm sure that if I understood all of refactoring and all of these things, that would help a little bit. But how do you, yeah, how do you start with what is good code? Um, yeah, at this level. That is a whole, like, there are a lot of philosophical programming books about that. There's one that I have recently read that um, broke all of my code because all of my code looks awful now. And the name of the oh, book no. is Five Lines of Code, uh, which tells you what the book is about. Uh, his advice is that functions should not be longer than five lines. Um it's a it's fairly uh like that's fairly extreme but once i started writing this way i really like it especially with f2 in our studio that you can just f2 to go to the next function but the idea is that the name of a function should tell you what it does so you don't have to read it um yeah and yes the answer is totally vibes that is, that's the uh, short way of saying all of this <laughs> that like the, the five lines philosophy is really extreme and it makes for kind of like you can go over the top with it for sure. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I like the discipline of, okay, the function names have to just make sense. So you only have to read it if you care how it works, but it, otherwise it's telling you what it does. And so you can just read the code and go, okay, I can see what that does. Um, but yeah, it's purely philosophical. There aren't hard and fast rules around that. I think, or I won't be surprised if uh, Headley gets into some of that in design um, as he writes more in there. I know, or I'm pretty sure that where I first heard about Five Lines of Code was that he was reading it and he brought it up at, in one of the Q and A's we did. So um, I don't know how much he has adopted it, but he was reading it at least. Um, yeah, to me, I, that makes some sense, but there's so many function definitions, even in this silly example, not silly, sorry, just the basic example. If you have, you know, oh, we're deciding if you have some function called, um, uh, what, what do they call it? Localized beach, right? Like, okay, some human is making some decide decision about how we're localizing the speech. And yes, okay, here we just have it in a simple table, but you can envision like just one step more complex of a problem where there are three or four human-ish decisions made here. And that the more abstract your function is, the more you're taking away from it, that when I'm salsifying temperature, it's like, okay, well, what, what was this doing anyway? You know, like where was this decision mm -hmm. coming from? Um, okay, that's not where localized speech is. Yeah, it is. Not where. Oh, whatever. Um, yeah, that. Oh, they do it in a pipe in the script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but just that, you know, there are very few functions I feel like that have no, um, you know, human decision making. No, that that then you need you're stuck looking at doc. You're looking at source code or documentation. Like how much documentation is your coworker going to write for something kind of simple that they think is I don't know. Like how, when yeah, I think it's not clear when you're making things better by abstracting and compartmentalizing and when you're adding overhead. And I'm sure it's clear to other people, but I don't have that style, code style I, internalized at all. I don't think it is clear. I mean, you know, I guess certain types of people it's clear to, but I think you have to um, have a certain like uh, uh, I'm right attitude in order for it to become clear. And so I don't think it's clear to many reasonable people. Um, because there are like there isn't a right answer um 
I know like an old version of this used to be that uh, your function shouldn't be too big to fit in the window because you want to be able to read it. So, you know, that's not five lines. That looks like 15 lines of code in your window set up right now. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, that general idea of that's, I mean, that's where all of it comes from is you want to be able to like actually read your code, you know, like a paragraph, like make it readable. Um, it seems hard to collaborate then. Like if I'm looking at someone's code and I'm like, I don't like this, but I have no idea there, there's not a style oh. where I can say like my way is better. It's just like, I don't like this. <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely think, uh, you know, I recommend coming to that agreement with anyone you're collaborating with as much as you can. Okay. Um, we, we had rules at my old job and that was before I read five lines of code or that might've been, I mean, that's not a rule because you can't, you know, like there's some discussion in the chat that a lot of times you can't reasonably go down to five lines. You can get close, but some things just can't split apart. I mean, in order to split them apart, all you're doing is making a child function that does most of the work. And, you know, it, it, it ends up being silly sometimes, although not as often as I thought it was going to be. Um, but I, I, you know, we might have had that a rule around that at my old job if uh, I had read that before I left. Um, I haven't read this one, so I'm going to definitely um, read on Hal's summary and then possibly read the book. Hey, um, this book was a great experience because in my work, I, as a reporting analyst, I'm, it's constant to me making changes to reports, and I was driving crazy just making changes. <laughs> so I needed a better way to cope so when yep. they ask me, hey, I need something a little bit different. I don't need to remain <laughs> my code. So, and yeah, that, that, I said that book changed my life. Basically, when I need <laughs> to make a, any change, I need, okay, I know that I have these break by functions and I know where I need to make the change and what is the change that I need to change. So basically, uh, making changes, me before one week and now i can do it maybe in two or three hours mm -hmm. and basically what i learned about creating functions is that you need to create a explicit function not a funky function like ah this is uh my analysis no no no. you need okay. to you need to explain and make clear for anyone that doesn't is involved in the project what do you mean with that expression sometimes yeah. the point is that we have an objective and we want to have all the objectives in one function. So you start writing that function uh, with that objective, and then you try to see if you can split that function in other ones, so you can pipe one to other. So if you create too many lines of code, it's hard that just one verb would explain what you are doing in that code, because you right. are making too many things. As soon as, to me, it's more practical. You have a bird to explain what you are doing. Uh, that's the, the size of, of the function. Mass the, mass are the number of lines. So you just need to make sure that your function is just making one thing. Yeah, yep. Um, definitely. I've, I've been reading a lot of this kind of book. Unfortunately, there aren't any that I had found yet that are like open access, so we can't do a book club on them. Um, like I said, I think design is going to have some of this kind of stuff in it. And that's, I think that's why he's writing it is he's like, okay, I've written all this stuff about like the nuts and bolts of how to code, but now he's writing his philosophy book, basically <laughs> of how you should code. <laughs> um, and that's what all of these are. And it's like this person's philosophy on how you should code. Um, but like the, a lot of them come around uh, or are around this general idea of um, making it really clear what your code does. So, you know, having the, that name that makes sense and having the code that is structured such that the name can make sense so that you, you know what it does without reading it, unless you're looking into the details of like, okay, but how do you implement that? Okay, that's when you have to actually read the code. Um, but especially with the like thinking in pipes, 
where the you know if you read the pipe as and then and then the function name is telling you what you do next it's really easy to or not it's, it really makes sense it really fits in that philosophy to do these short little functions that are just doing that that small piece um so to me at least but i like i was reading so many of these like philosophy of programming style books that I got a subscription to Manning Online because buying individual books wasn't making sense anymore. So, um, oh, wow. Yeah, it's after five. <laughs> I did not notice. Um, yes. A little, a little spelling error on that last sentence. There you go. That's your contribution. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <no> request. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, it's it's really funny. Like, uh, he's been doing a lot of edits directly to the main branch in this, and those don't send, uh, like email up alerts that something has changed from GitHub. Oh. And so I keep coming to it and being like, ah, oh, he wrote another chapter, and I didn't know. So. <laughs> Um, that's funny. Also, he's been working on other things, so he hasn't gotten that much writing <clears throat> done on it. But like the uh, identity strategy chapter, I just saw today uh, that at least a version of it exists. I haven't had a chance to, to dig in and see how done it is. Um, yeah. Cool. A great discussion, everyone. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Angel, it looks like you have uh, next week, and then we have uh, two weeks off. Um, yeah, so looking forward to it, and uh, I'll see everyone next week. Thank you all. all right. yes, I won't Brian. be here.